I wanted to welcome again our live stream brethren. We um, are very thankful that the Lord's given us this resource, and um, it's like He's expanded the ministry. You know, the Lord will do that if you're faithful. If you use what He's given you, He'll He'll open doors where you can share it with other people. And, and I feel like the Lord's done this, and um, so I want to be faithful to give Him thanks for that. I also wanted to uh, give thanks to the Lord for um, bringing Brother Brett back to us. I, I, I was very edified um, to have fellowship with Brother Brother Brett, and I wanted to give thanks to God for that as well. Also, um, I wanted to say, if you're the kind of person that follows the, the little cards we put out with the sermons, this isn't technically number nine, this is technically number 10, but number nine we're going to use as a Sunday school lesson. I know it's kind of a... Sunday school thing, but anyway, I, I want, I tell you why, I'll tell you why I wanted to do that is because it's on singing of the mercy and it's, in other words, it's expressing the mercy and I thought this would be the best way to, to do this, this, cover this adequately was to open it up to the brethren to be able to, to um, express their, their understanding of that. Anyway, so next time I have the lesson, I'll have it on singing of the mercy. Tonight, today we're going to go over, I'm going to call it part nine. It's his ninth message on it. Anyway, reasoning on the mercy. Now, the, the, the reason it's been my desire to give these series of messages on the mercy of God is to expose this specific aspect of God's character and to bring it to light, so to speak, in order that we, the vessels of mercy, may have a greater appreciation for it. See, it... It, wouldn't it be a terrible thing for those vessels of mercy not to understand what happened to them? Not to understand. See, we, we are like God's trophies of mercy. Yeah. You're a vessel of mercy. Well, it would behoove us to, um, to, uh, to fully understand what's happened because we're, we're in the ages to come. We're going to be used by God to explain this thing. If you could, that was kind of a vulgar way to say it, but you see what I'm saying? God's going to use his vessels of mercy to show forth yeah. his mercy. Amen. All right, we've, we've, been, we've participated of the abundance of grace. God's given us grace. How do you know that? Because you've been saved from the wrath to come. You've been, you've been baptized into Christ. That all happened because he gave you grace. Uh, grace has been bestowed on all who've believed. Yeah, they did our participants in this grace. And and by that, or through that, you've been a benefactor of God's mercy. Today, by the grace of God working in me, I want, to, I want us to examine the reasonableness of mercy. It's right. Not only is it right for God to be merciful, this is a part of who he is. Now, our text is found in Romans 12, 1, which has already been read for us. I'll read it again. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now, this is, he's not asking too much. If you can see mercy right, yeah. this will be your conclusion. I'm going to give myself to him. This is what Paul's saying. Now, Amen. if the righteousness of God were his only characteristic, then man would have never been made from the dust of the earth. It, he would not have done that. If, that. if all he was was righteous, he wouldn't have made a creature that had the capacity to fall. It wouldn't have been right. But, see, God's showing us something here. God's showing us that there's more to him than just one aspect. He's a big God. Now, we, in salvation that we have right now, God has not divulged his entire everything about him. On the ages to come, we're not going to run out of things to see about God. God's character, God's person is large. And in order for you to properly understand him, you have to understand what he's revealed. You can't come up with some aspect about God on your own. You can't just sit there and say, Oh, well, I've seen this new aspect. That's going to be in the revelation. God's going to have to reveal it first. And then he's going to have to give you to understand the revelation. So God's in this thing the whole way through. Amen. See, if God, let's just say that God's, if he was only merciful. If that's all he was, he was just merciful. 
Well, then it really wouldn't make any difference what you did, right? If he was just merciful, it wouldn't make any difference what you did because he would just forgive you anyway. It wouldn't make any difference. It would never impact him. But doesn't that sound a lot like the God we're hearing about today? Yeah. God's not just merciful. He's righteous. He's holy. He's just. See, he's, God is God. God's who he is. Mary, isn't that what he told Moses to tell him? I am that I am. He hasn't changed. That's who he is. And as you become more acquainted with him, you start seeing the depth. God has depth. Yeah. See, you say, well, well God, God loves you. Well, how do you know that, number one? God will forgive you. Have they repented? How, how can you make these determinations? God's put it in his word exactly who he is, who he accepts. See, he's, he's made it known. Now, if you're going to be, if you're a humble person that comes and you repent, something has gone before that. Something's happened in you to, to precipitate that response. Well, we're finding out God's merciful. He's a merciful God. He is long-suffering, but that isn't all he is. He will by no means acquit the guilty. It's what he said. Now, see, we, we can't compartmentalize God and say, well, I just, want to, I just want to see his merciful part. That's all I want. I just want to see his merciful part. This other stuff about him being filled with wrath against sin. And, oh, no, see, it's when God expresses himself, he's very precise, and he expects that precise revelation to accomplish something in those that believe. Now we know that people who don't believe God, people that don't recognize him as God, they're not going to have the proper response. They're just not. But see, those, those who believe, those who say, I believe, they're taking upon themselves a, a profound responsibility now to conform to what God has said. In other words, they're going to be beaten with many stripes if they don't. They, 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 they brought themselves into this arena of responsibility. And to stand up and say, I'm a believer, then you better be a believer. Say, well, wait a minute, but God's merciful. He'll forgive me. Well, see, this is what we're thinking about here. This is what we're thinking about. God is merciful. There's no doubt about that. God's merciful. He, he told it to Moses. Remember, he said, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-serving, and abundant in goodness and truth. You can't separate those from God. There's no way. This is what he is. But, you can say, and... He will, not buy, he will not acquit the guilty. He won't do it. He won't. He by no means clear the guilty. So how, how much so? He'll visit the iniquity upon the third, the fourth generation. This is God. This is a God that we that, that, that's, that's gave us the scriptures, that's created new life in you, and this is the God with whom we have to do. He's very specific concerning how he is represented. The world today, I fear, is not been acquainted with the real God. Those who have been given grace to believe need to be aware that God will not overlook their sin. What? Sounds simple, doesn't it? Say, wait a minute, I've been given grace to believe. There's some who would argue with me about this. If you've been given grace to believe, then God has overlooked your sin. I can't read anywhere where God overlooks sin. Sin has to be repented of, which means something has to happen. You have to be delivered. You have to be given to repent. Amen. Now, if sin's not repented of and holiness not embraced, then man is in essence living contrary to the revealed implications of the gospel. The, the very nature of the gospel is that Jesus came and he took away sin by the sacrifice of himself, and he offers that salvation to you if. Neither, have you ever heard anybody say there's no ifs in, in the gospel? They just lied. There has to be a turning away from sin, a repentance. Yeah. Now, every revealed aspect of God's nature can and must be reasoned on. All right? Now, salvation causes you to, to see something clearly. I'm lost. I, I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. Now, at what point in time after, let's say okay, you, you came into the kingdom, you saw this clearly, I, I can't do it myself, I need him to do it, you repented of your sins. At what point in time in the walk to glory do, is that fact ever negated? I mean, is there ever a time when 
when all of a sudden now you can do it. Now, okay, I've been on the road to glory, and I don't need Jesus anymore. I'm doing pretty good. That's just a delusion. At no point in time, I'm talking even in the ages to come, will there ever come a time when you can, you can exist or without Christ, that you can make it, that you can, you, it's just not possible. If Jesus ever leaves the throne room, you've got to go with him. You've got, you can't stay in heaven without Jesus. So he's going to beseech you. He's going to beseech you by the mercies of God. The very fact that God was merciful unto you, there is, a, there is a, an expected reflex, as it were, from those who have received this mercy, and that is self-denial, self-sacrifice. I'm, I'm going to give myself to the one who saved me. If that, if that isn't there, and this is what my, my whole thought on this the sermon today is if that's not there, then you really don't know what mercy is. You really haven't participated in the mercy of God. Now, you may be on the fringe of it. I'm, I'm not saying that you can't come up to speed. I, I myself, I think at one time, thought it really didn't make any difference what I did. But see, that was a lie. It does make a difference what you do. In, in, in other words, you're lying to yourself. If you think I can just do whatever I want, God loves me no matter what I do, well, see, one, you presumed on God's mercy. Amen. You presumed on it. Because, see, if Jesus, when he was carrying sin, if he, when he was made to be sin, if God turned us at worst face from him, if God, he said, why have you forsaken me? If this is the case, when the Holy One was, well, how much more? Do you think that God's not going not gonna to turn away from you? When you, when, you, when you sin, see, this is a serious, serious problem. Paul's reasoning here, when he's reasoning on the mercies of God, it's on the highest level possible. He's reasoning on the person of the living God. You see how he's, he's, he's getting people off of themselves. He's getting them to reason on the, the mercy of God. Now, if you can see it clearly, the mercy of God, there wasn't anything you did that would that that would got God's attention to where he said, I'm gonna be merciful to this one. No, this isn't it. God, this is the mercies of God we're talking about now. This is before the world ever was made. God determined I'm gonna expose that I'm a merciful God. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna expose this. Now, how's he gonna do it? Well, he's gonna have to be, he's gonna have to make man from the dust of the earth. It's a, he's gonna have to make him vulnerable. If God's gonna expose that he's merciful, he has to he has to have someone to be merciful to. Well, how God's going to do this? He's not going to. God's not going to make someone sinful, is He? No. See, there is no sin in Him. There's no variableness of turning in God. But God's wise. He makes man in His own image from the dust of the earth. And the first time that we hear about that they're tempted, they fall. Now, from God's standpoint, you look at it; you, it things are right on track. Things are right on track. See, I'm, he got to look back. And he's going to be a merciful God now. He's going to be long-suffering. Now, in order for you to be long-suffering, you have to be able to suffer long, right? You, you can't be a, say, well, I'm very long-suffering, and then just, I just don't have any patience with people. Well, then you're not long-suffering. It's just admit it and go on. God's long-suffering. In other words, he has the ability to bear long with people, even though part of his nature... If, 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 if part of his nature just says, just destroy him. If it's, he's not like that. God never operates. God's not at conflict with his own person. His righteousness is never at war with his mercy. It's never, it's not that way. He's always doing everything. Part of him is always at work in everything he does. And it's always fully represented. Is that He's not like cheating his righteousness by saving men. No, he's righteous in doing it. He does it the right way. Paul's reasoning, because Paul can see it clearly. Now, now this is, I think I've, I really want to see this more clearly, even than I have. But see, Paul can see it so clear that Paul knows how to minister it. Paul's not just throwing something out here and hoping that he gets some good fruit out of it. Paul can see it. And so Paul's reasoning with them. Because he knows if they can see it, you won't need a law telling them, you ought to, you better get right, you better do the right thing. If they can see this, 
they'll lay down their life for Christ. They'll do it. Amen. In other words, if those listening will actually fo follow Paul's line of reasoning, and if they actually do follow his line of reasoning and still decide not to follow Christ, then he's going to know. Nah, they, see, see, well, I've, I come to church and I listen to the sermons and I listen to everything. It's just I never get around to living holy. Well, you didn't really hear it. You didn't really hear it. You were in the building. I mean, the words came out of the preacher's mouth, but they never really came into you and they never changed you. Well, what is that an indication of? Well, it could be an indication that God's rejected them. Now, if you can hear the gospel and go away saying, well, that sounds pretty, but it's just not for me. Why, why do people do that? Well, see, there's at least an indication. This is a fearful thing, number one, but it's an indication. He did say that if you're not received to what? Knock the dust off your feet. And chum up to them and say everything's going to be all right, right? Mm -hmm. But this is what's going on in our environment today. It's just like, well, wait a minute. We don't want to be, we don't want to judge anyone. Well, that's a judgment, right? Amen. What I'm saying is that at least at the bottom line, this is a very serious situation when people refuse to listen to the Apostle Paul that was sent to them yeah. to give them. This, this line of reasoning that if followed, if they really do listen to Paul and say, okay, I'm going to take this serious, it will make them lay down their life for Christ. They'll, they'll do it. See, Paul's, Paul's words are reasonable because they're founded on a reasonable God that's done something that's reasonable. He's been merciful when you didn't deserve mercy. Why? Because he wanted to. God wanted to save men. What if, after, well, after we've read Romans 11, we've scoured it, we've looked at the whole thing, we've, we've almost memorized it, and yet we don't present our bodies a living sacrifice. We get to 12.1 and we're like, well, all right, I'm going to do that. But they just never get around to doing it. Do we have any hope of not being cut off? I mean, can a person rest on the fact that, well, hey, I was baptized. I was baptized. And so because of that, this other stuff, I mean, that's for, that's for, I, I would go along with that's for you. But now when it gets to me now, you know, I know, I, it, I know just me saying it is ridiculous. I can't imagine what it looks like from heaven. When people who make a profession claim an identity with Christ, and yet never get around to picking up that cross and following after him. Now Paul's asking those who have believed. This is not, Paul's words are not to the sinful nations. He's talking to the church now. Amen. The fact that he's talking to the church should perk our ears up. Wait a minute, he's talking to me. He's asking those who have believed to backtrack and the reason on how they have believed. How did you get where you're at right now? If you do believe now, if you really do believe, how'd you get here? Well, I, I can tell you right now, if a person's in a sound mind, they'll say it wasn't by works of righteousness that I did. It wasn't by anything that I did. I, I, I didn't move God to give me grace. God was on the move all by himself because of his nature, because of who he is. He was on the move to give you grace. Now, what do you have to do to qualify to get grace? Well, you have to humble yourself on the mighty hand of God, and then he'll give you to believe. Did you believe the record when it was proclaimed to you? Did you believe the record? If you did, God was in Christ. See, he was reconciling you. Now, this is a personal thing, and it's a one-on-one -on -one thing. I can't believe for you, and you can't believe for me. But you can help me to believe. You can do that. Peter also uses the same line of reasoning. Remember, I'm talk we're talking about the being saved, independent from your own works. He says, 1 Peter 2.10, which in times past were not a people. There was a time when you weren't even a people. God didn't recognize you. But are now the people of God, which have not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. 
Oh, we can all tell, we can all testify about this time. Oh, we knew, we knew we weren't saved. There, was, there wasn't any doubt in our mind. The gospel came, and we knew well, there's something wrong. This message goes, goes out, and it says, you're going to be lost unless you believe the record that God gave of a son to tell what Christ did, and you believed it from the heart. You believed the form of the doctrine. And you said, I want to be baptized. What happened? He gave you mercy. He extended it to you. That day, the mercy of God that was almost like an ethereal idea out here became real. You experienced the mercy of God. Amen. Peter's comparing, technically, if you look at the text, he's comparing those who were appointed to stumble at this rock of offense and, and those who were given to come out of the darkness and into the light. That comparison. See, if you, Paul's asking you, you, the ones who were brought out of the darkness, do never lose sight of this. See, you, you reason on this that if God brought me out of the darkness and put me into the light, what is the natural evolution of that? I'm going to lay down my life. I'm going to give up my life because technically I didn't have any life. I was dead in trespasses and sins. Now Christ comes along, Holy Spirit convicts you of sin, and you repent, and Christ gives you life. Now, what are you going to use that life for? Yeah. This is the big question. What are you going to use his life for? He says, you lay it down. You lay it down. You sacrifice yourself the way Christ did to save you, and that will be acceptable to God. God will be pleased with that. In fact, this is your reasonable service. Yeah. This, is like, this is like the starting line. Before you're going to make any progress with God, you're going to have to die to yourself. And at that point in time, anyone who's done it, anyone who's, who's, who can stand and testify and say, I picked up my cross today, they're the happiest for it. Yeah. it this, this, this is not like a burden. The, the Satan, he wants to say, well, you're going to give up everything. No, you didn't have anything to give up. You didn't have anything. You were dust and ashes. You were nothing. God didn't even recognize you as a person. Now in Christ, you, you have a name. See, I'm looking forward. You're going you're to get a new name. I'm looking forward. Are you looking forward to that? Give me the awarding of the names. So, all right, I'm going to give you this new name. How are you going to get that? Deny ungodliness and worldly lust and live soberly and righteously in this present world. You're on your way. You're on your way now. You deny. You deny. How about those who don't? They have no hope of getting a new name. Let's just be honest. This is not going to happen. Deny ungodliness. Peter's reasoning, <clears throat> if followed, will lead the believer to see that they've arrived under the protection and provisional grace of God because he wanted to do it. That's the only reason why. It wasn't by works of righteousness that we did. Peter's reasoning his, his, Paul reveals God concluded on this matter. Remember in Romans eleven thirty two, 32, Paul reveals that God had already made a conclusion long before you ever believed. He concluded all of them, Jew and Gentile, in unbelief. Why? That he might have mercy on all of them. Amen. Well, see, now, before long, before I was ever born, God had made it a conclusion. There came a point in time when God's conclusion was my conclusion. He, he brought me to this place to where I had the same conclusion. I was dead in trespasses and sins, and he quickened me and made me alive. Now, uh, what's the natural? The, the, the natural response to that is, I'm going to lay down my life. Because God had mercy on me. That's why. So see, they, well, people say, well, why are you a Christian? Some people say, oh, I don't know. It wasn't my idea. Paul regularly took the brethren back to where they were to help. He, he took them back to a point in time when they could fully understand that it wasn't them that did it. And we need to be brought back to that, to see it clearly, see? Because, <clears throat> quite frankly, there's too much flesh in religion. Amen. Paul's asking, he, he's asking those who have believed to look back, to ponder, 
See, remember, Peter said, you've forgotten that you were purged from your old sins. That's what, that's the problem. He diagnosed the problem. You forgot that you were purged from your old sins. How about this one in Ephesians 2, 1? <clears throat> and you, he's talking about believers now, and you hath he quickened or made alive. You were dead, but he made you alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now, technically, this is a standalone statement. That's just a fact of the matter. You, you were dead, and he made you alive. Now, but Paul elaborates on the statement because if we're to fully understand the mercy of God, we've got to be able, we got to be fully persuaded that we didn't have anything to do with it. Now, I remember when they would make an altar, he said, don't you lift up a tool on it. Don't do it. Because the moment you do it, you defile it. And it's the same thing with salvation. The moment you, you allow any kind of your work to enter into it, yeah. well, see, what the problem is is that it won't be effective. You won't be able to overcome sin if you're harboring this, this, this spot in your mind that I'm, I'm helping God. You are? Yeah. You, you're helping God save you? It's just God. It's just God that's working in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Now, what else is there in salvation? Uh, I would ask you, what else is there to be saved? To will and to do. And both of them, he says, God's working in you to do. So see, it's God, God's saving us. Now, some will say, well, then fine. Just sit back and let him save us then. You, you, but see, that, that's not what Paul's saying, is it? Paul's saying... That if you can see this clearly, that it's God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. If you can see this clearly, you'll lay down your life. That's right. This is what will happen. And, uh, and now James is going to come along and say, if you don't, you didn't see it. See? If, if, if you don't lay down your life, I don't care what you tell me, you haven't seen that God's mercy was extended to you. You haven't seen it rightly. Where in time past you walked, Paul's going to elaborate on this, <clears throat> according to the course of this world, I see how much you had to do with this. Let's see how much did you add to salvation. According to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Paul's just given them eight reasons why it was impossible for them to be saved on their own righteousness. Thank you. He's just given them eight reasons why, if you want to look at it from one standpoint, it's impossible that they could be saved. God's righteous now. He's given them eight reasons why... How could you possibly come before a righteous God? But God. He goes on. Yeah. But God. See, this is, not, this is not hard for God. If you look at it from, from easy or hard, it wasn't hard for God to save man. It was involved. God had to do the work. Yeah. But God, who's rich in mercy. He's rich in mercy. Yeah. Uh, there, there's, a, there's a sense in which you... You were exactly where God needed you to be to save you. Yeah. You see, you, you were, you, I read all these things, all these eight things. You were, you were participating in things that there's no way you could get out of them. So what does God do? He's rich in mercy. Yeah. He extends his mercy to you. What does that do? You're not involved in them anymore. He took, his mercy was involved in bringing you out of that and into his marvelous light. And now there's not anybody that's actually participating in that that would look back and say, oh, I did a good job. Yeah. That's what he's saying. He's saying, if, look, if you can see this clearly, you'll lay down your life. You'll do it. Right. What happens when people don't lay it down? They don't see it clearly. And so it's my prayer that, that this can be preached in such a way that it makes laying it down appealing. And how do you do that? You highlight the mercy of God. God's merciful. He's merciful. God's not willing that any would perish. Any who? Any of those who believe. Yeah. If you believe the record that God gave of his son, God's interested in bringing you to glory. That's why you believed. Yeah. Believe me, people who don't believe are not interested in going to glory. Why? 
No, it's, God's not in this work. God's in the work of bringing many sons to glory. All right, God, who is rich in mercy. When those who are in Christ reason on the mercy, it produces specific effects that cannot be duplicated by any other means. What I'm saying is, is that when you set your mind to cogitate, to reason on God, something happens in you that can't happen any other way. It can't be manufactured by a creed. It can't be manufactured by, by a program or any other way. As you personally now, you, you set your mind on God. I'm going to reason on God. Something happens in you that is eternal. See, it's a, you can't make it happen any other way. Look at Hebrews 10.32. But call to remembrance the former days in which, after you were illuminated, you endured a great fight of afflictions. You remember that now. You keep that in your mind. You ponder that. That when I, when I believed, it changed. When I believed, I had the power. When I believed, I was able to fight against the enemy and stand. You remember that? Because there's going to come a time when it's going to seem like that's not true anymore. But you just you remember back. When God was with me and I knew it, I didn't have any trouble with sin. Now, now why am I having some trouble? Because you, you, you've, you've moved away from this. You've moved away from trusting in the God that saved you. Not forgetting where you came from as far as when you was in sin and now you're out of sin. Not remembering that is part and parcel of, of I mean, remembering that, not forgetting it, is part and parcel of understanding the implications of mercy. If you can understand that God's merciful, it won't provoke you to sin. I know some people think this. Some people think if you preach a lot about grace, then the people are going to go out and sin. But that's just a lie. That's not the truth. If you see God clearly, the last thing it produces is a, a desire to go sin. Amen. Actually, what happens if you don't understand God, then you go out and sin. See, we need to preach grace, preach God, preach God, because God is grace. See, he, he's merciful, he's gracious, he's long-suffering. This is who God is. I don't get, I don't get results by, by thinking about I need to be more merciful. All right, I'll just focus on this. If I can be more merciful then I'll be better. No, you won't. If you can see God more clearly, then now that'll have an effect for good. There will never come a time in the ages to come that we will ever forget why we are in heaven. Yeah, right. Not going to be walking around the pearly gates and think, well, look, I, I did pretty good. It's not going to happen like that. See, the, the believers, the ones who are in Christ, they're the ones that are the most sensitive to his words and his to follow him. They're, they're sensitive. Why? Because they know whom they have believed in. They, we have examples in the scriptures of those whom the, the Lord had mercy on. He really did have mercy on them. And yet they forgot. See, they, the things that people that God did things for. And yet, after a while, they started thinking, well, I did pretty good. And the first one that came to my mind is, is King Saul. He, um, now, can, you, you know this. Saul wasn't walking around every day filled with expectations about someday being the king. Thinking, oh, that when, as soon as I'm king, then I'll this and that. Then it wasn't his expectations at all. And yet God made him king. See, it's, it's, he, there was no reason for Saul to, to, to turn into the person that he turned into. There wasn't anything God had done, I mean. And yet he did. Shows you how flesh, you can't, you can't teach flesh. You can't yeah. scant school flesh. Yeah. Spiritual life is lived in the awareness of the one who granted it. If you have spiritual life, then see, the, whole, the very fact that you have spiritual life, that you know God, that promotes you walking in the spirit and living in the spirit and see that, that's just part and parcel with that just that's part of being spiritual but see they have spiritual life and then look back and say well now i'm in i don't have nothing to worry about see that's not spiritual life doesn't promote that kind of thinking yeah. 
Philippians 2.5 says, let this mind be in you. Now, you'll find that everyone, everyone has a certain mindset. I don't care who they are. Everyone operates by a certain set of standards, a certain way they think. There are not that many mindless actions even in your own very life, if you think about it. Everything you do is calculated by something. You, you had to think this thing through to some degree. And even, even the, the supposedly mindless ones, if you really looked at it, they, your mind was involved in doing it. So you use your mind all the time. So if you stop and consider for a moment, you'll see that almost every action you've ever made was the result of either the mind of Christ or the mind of the flesh. There was something that, would, that actually, even if you didn't understand it at the time, it was driving you in a certain direction. Now, what he's saying is, let's reason on the mercies of God. Let's, let's find out how, why you were saved. What, what motivated God to save you? Because if you can see that clearly, then there won't be any trouble for you to lay down your life. This won't be like a big, like, oh, i got to lay down my life. Yeah, you do. God will lay down your life. But since this is true, since that um, everything you do filters through your mind, then the apostle calls on those who've been made free to willingly choose to humble themselves under the mighty hand of God. Now, see, since technically only those who are in Christ are free, this, this can't be said to everybody. Yes, I mean, it, see, you've come into Christ now. You've been free indeed. You've been made free. Yeah. You're free now. You're free to what? You're free to serve Christ. You're free to serve God. Mm -hmm. See, you're not, you're not free <clears throat> technically to go out of the camp, as it were, and to go off like a renegade. You're not free to do that. Amen. If you do that, you've gone back. Let this mind be in you. Why? The exhortation is to those who are already in Christ, already walking by faith, mm -hmm. you let this mind be in you. In other words, you let this mind direct your, your, the, your decisions, the things that you do. Mm -hmm. Who was also in Christ Jesus. Now, if anyone, you say, well, if anyone could be a renegade, it would be Christ, right? I mean, he was holy and righteous and perfect. He said, I only do the things that the Father told me to do. That's all I do. In fact, the words that I speak unto you, they're not my own. The Father gave them to me. He, that's what it says, Jesus' mind now. And so, see, he calls upon us to have the same mind. Why? Because it will result in the same act actions if you have the same mind. So what did he do? What did he do when he was here? But made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men, Found a fashion as a man, he humbled himself. So now he's saying, if you have the same mind, you'll humble yourself. This is what will happen. So what happens if I don't humble myself? Well, then I don't have the same mind. You can read them backwards. Unless we have a clear understanding of who is animating our actions, life will be kind of like a blur. You won't really be able to determine well, why did I do that. I mean, I'm talking after you've done it. See, it's after you've done it, it's technically too late. Now you got to repent. But see, the apostles are trying to arrest our thinking to where we'll reason it out before we actually do something. Yeah. Say, wait a minute. Why do I even want to do that? See, that's what Paul had in Romans 7. Why do I even want to do this? Well, there's sin that's in my members. Ah, there's this another law in my members. Yeah. Well, see, because of that, I've, I've got to filter everything I do. Through this mind of Christ. Now, wait a minute. Yeah. Uh, years ago, Brother Given gave me this, and it, this is good. Whatever you want to do, just think, can I do it right in front of God? Can I do it right at the judgment? Come to the judgment. Can I do this thing? Because, see, if it's right, you can. If it's right, if God would approve of it, then you could do it right at the judgment. It'd be fine. But if I can't. See, there's so many things I found in my own life that I, I look at them later, and I think, well, that wasn't the best thing. It wasn't like a sin, but it wasn't the best thing. All right, you let this mind be in you. It was also in Christ Jesus, and you'll have less frequent occasions like that. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Spiritual life is lived on purpose. It's on purpose you live for Christ. Amen. Nobody accidentally lives for Christ. A lot of people accidentally live. You know, they're here, and they got a heartbeat, and they're running around. Yeah. 
They're like, act, they're, they're sort of like accidents waiting to happen. The things are going to happen, and it's usually bad, but you don't have to be one of those. If you're in Christ, you can live every moment on purpose. Amen. I'm doing this for Christ on purpose. Amen. Now, it may look like a disadvantage now, but wait till I get to heaven. Yeah. Wait till I get to heaven. Yeah. They say, well, wait a minute. If you think about life, if you think about Christ in light of life, you'll do better. It's just the way it is. Christ's example is one of absolute control over every expression emanating from his person, both toward God and man. That's Christ. See, he, he had control. Now, you want to have control? You walk, you walk like he walked. You have the same mind that he had. What will happen is, I tell you what happened. Same thing he did. He laid down his life. And you'll lay down your life for the brethren. Amen. See, the problem is that we're not, we got, we, we, we got to have this exhortation because we're living in the enemy territory. We have an enemy right inside of ourselves. So see, to, to be consistent, he's helping us to be consistent. Even in that, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. See, that don't allow sin to run rampant in your members when you see it. See, that's when you confess it. Why? Because you, you have another mind. It's, not, it's like sin isn't in agreement with your new mind. And so when you see it, let it, let it arrest you. Let it be alarming to you. Because it should be alarming to you. And confess it. And he's faithful and just now. Forgive us of our sins. When you're convinced that you'll have to stand before God and give an account of your actions, nobody has to tell you to crucify the flesh. When you're convinced of that, when you see that clearly... Now nah, you don't need a law. You've been made free. Mm -hmm. Now, technically, you could say somebody that has this understanding, you go out and do whatever you want. You just do whatever you want. Now, I'm talking about the new man now. But see, if you understand that you're going to have to give an account, and I'm not saying you just have a mental assent. You know it. See, you're not going to want to do the wrong thing. When you're aware that there's a certain and specific mindset at working in you, when, when you can see it clearly then you won't, you won't want to think about the wrong things, right? You won't. You won't, you won't want to be engaged in bad things. You'll, you'll be engaged in things that most people, I say most being worldly people, they draw back from. Like, how about this? You know what I've been doing this whole afternoon? I've been examining myself to see if I'm in the kingdom. That's what I, I've been examining myself. I say, whoa, I don't want to think about that. I go to a ball game or something. I don't want to. I've been examining myself because I don't want to show up at the judgment and not be ready. Amen. They may think you're crazy, but we know they are. This is how Paul said it to Titus. For we ourselves who were sometimes foolish. See, we spent enough time being foolish. Yeah. It's time to move on to perfection. Yeah. Disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. We, we spent our time there. But see, something new's come. But, I'm thankful for the but here. But, after that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared towards man, not by works of righteousness that we've done. See, he's come to the point to where he sees, I know, I can cognitively tell you, I was in sin. But I can't give you a reason other than God wanted to for me being taken out of it. God wanted to save me. And I'm perfectly pleased with that situation. I'm perfectly pleased. God saved us. How? By the washing of regeneration, the renewing of the Holy Ghost. He made me new. Now I want to do the right thing. Even though I have this law, this other another law in my members, I, the, the, the new part of me is stronger than the old part. Amen. We're made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So as I was thinking about this, this thing about God being merciful, does that, does that just set right with you? When you see God as being merciful, is your first inclination, I wonder what I can get away with? See, it's not. It's not. And, and it's, it's, see, there's people saying that, but it's not. You're, see, if, you, if you're filled with hope, yeah, hope, I mean not hope so, your, your, your hope is actually drawing you to crucify the flesh, and at the same time, look forward to the day when you're going to get that new body, clothed upon with their body that can't sin, 
say, why would I be hoping to sin if someday I know I'm going to get a body that can't sin? See, it's like they're diametrically opposed thoughts. So see, your mind, it's, it's hoping. It's, it's set its affection on things above, and it's hoping that Christ, maybe Christ will come back right now. He'll come back right now. Yeah. Well, in that environment, you won't sin. If, if, if hope is dominating your mind, and, and, you, and you're anticipating, when the devil will come and say, hey, why don't you do this? He say, I don't want to do that. Amen. I'm hoping. I'm filled with hope. We're made heirs according to the hope. Now, you have to, this is like a little indicator. How much are you hoping? How much do you really want a God? How much do you really want to be filled with the fullness of God? Well, to the degree that you're hoping for it, you can have it. Amen. David asked this question of himself. It's a good question. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? You start doing inventory. And I started doing inventories, and I tell you, I'm a blessed man. I'm a blessed man. He'd given me an assembly of brethren that are filled with hope. I come here, and one th from the moment I hit the door, it's constant exhortation, yeah. constant building up. Uh, talk about faith and talk about justification. Talk about righteousness and holiness and peace. I'm a blessed man because I have a place to come that loves God. What shall I render to God? Now is the question. I'm a blessed man. Now what, what are you going to give back to God? All you got is you. That's all you really got. Lay it down. Give him you. And he'll give you himself. I'll take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. He was merciful to me. And what am I going to do with that? I'm going to live my life for him. Paul spoke to the Romans about those who presumed on the goodness of God. Romans 2, 4. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness? Would you really come into the kingdom of God? Partake of the divine nature. Escape the corruptions that are in the world. And then turn your back on taking up your cross. Amen. See, it doesn't fit. It doesn't make any sense. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth. See, there's some that you're not going to make them obey the truth. It's just the way it is. And you shouldn't be frustrated when they don't. If they don't want Christ, then knock the dust off your feet and get away from them. Amen. There's some that they will not obey Christ. They don't want to obey the gospel. They don't want to have this man to rule over them. But that's not the only people. See, there's some that are contentious, but that's not the only people. Yeah. All right? But glory and honor and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile, for there's no respecter of persons but God. So there's some people out there, you're going to meet them, that you can sense these people love God. These people, they, 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 wanna, they may not have all the understanding in the world, but they want to know God. What is this? This is God giving you, giving you people. He'll bring you somebody. You can minister one to another. God's going to render to every man according to his deeds. Now, say, wait a minute. God's merciful. And he's just and he's righteous and he gave us salvation. Then what is all this talk about rendering unto my deeds? See, this doesn't sound like it fits. Well, it does fit. See, that's, that's what David was talking about. What, what, what am I going to give? I can see, David could see that everything I've got, God gave it to me. Yeah. Now, what am I going to? See, D David saw there's, there's this rendering back to God that's got to happen. Amen. Now, when you can see it clearly... Every personality is obeying somebody. Every personality, I don't care who it is, they're obeying somebody. Now, if you can, I guess, I guess what I'm trying to say is if you can see that God's been merciful to you, if you can really see it clearly, then, then this will this, this like provoke you to give him more. To, 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 you say, well, I've given him everything. I can't give him anymore. But see, every, every morning, you wake up every morning, 
and it's new. His mercies are new every morning. So as, as, as you go through the day and you experience life, see, and you bring God into the scenario, you, you, you allow him to be merciful to you as you submit to him. That's, that, it, you don't really understand God's mercy until you're living, a circumstance comes up, and, and you lay down your life. You give it, you give it to him. Then you'll see his mercy. You'll understand how he's, look at how merciful he was to me. This could have happened or that could have happened. But it wasn't because God was merciful to me. He brought me through it. But if you don't ever live for him, you never really can understand that God's merciful. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, not an old dead sacrifice, not one like they used to throw up on the altar. Didn't have really any say in it, did it? This is a living sacrifice. This is something you're doing willingly. Gave us Christ as the example. Can't have any better example than Christ. He is a living sacrifice. And now he calls upon you, if Christ is in you, to be a living sacrifice too, to lay down your life just like he did. And then you'll do the same thing. You'll get the same. See, he says, I overcame and sat down on my father's throne. And if you'll overcome, you can sit down with me in my throne. See, they get the same benefit. The fact is that we do not have the ability to maintain a single moment of spiritual life on our own. He wants us to know that because in the knowledge of that, we'll overcome. See, in the knowledge of that, the, I, didn't, I didn't manufacture the grace I have. It was given to me. Well, now when I use it, see, I, I'll be using it for the right reason. I won't be like taking it upon the glory on myself. I'll be able to acknowledge God was the one that would, brought me to this this wonderful place, and so he'll keep me if I see it right. In other words, we present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is the only reasonable thing to do when we know and understand what's at stake. Mm-hmm. When you can see, God hasn't brought me out into the desert to kill me. I'm out in the desert. I'll have to testify to that. I know I'm out in the desert. I, I'm out in the wilderness. This is not my home. But God didn't bring me out here to kill me. He brought me out here to sanctify me. He brought me out here to teach me that this not by works of righteousness that I have. There's nothing here that I want. What kind of motivation can consistently move a child of God to crucify their flesh with the affections of the love? What does it take to do that? To see the mercy of God. When you see it clearly, you'll do the other. Thank you, brother.